All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Sean Rhodes, who is in probably an equally, if not more sunny Tampa Bay today. It's great to be here, John. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And Sean is a global expert on pivoting in challenging environments. As a war correspondent with the U.S. Marine Corps, uh, Sean traveled to more than two dozen countries learning how elite teams executed their toughest missions. And then you wrote the book Bulletproof Selling, Systemizing Sales for the Battlefield of Business. All right. So let's get straight into it, um, Sean. Uh, when you were first as a as a uh, as a war correspondent, you know, with with the Marine Corps and that, what initially did you see that you thought, huh, here's some really good stuff that I should I could take into the civilian world, if you like? Well, it was definitely long before I started in the world of sales, John. So my war, my role as a war correspondent was to embed inside these combat teams as a U.S. Marine. I was enlisted. I was carrying a rifle mm -hmm. and a camera and a notepad. And to go around and really figure out how are they able to accomplish what most people think is impossible. Um, what I mean by that is to go into a building where they know some people are in there waiting to do them harm. And yet these men and women volunteer to do it. And where there's a 50 percent conversion rate uh, in the Marine Corps world, that means 50 percent of these folks are not expected to leave that building under their own power. And yet they consistently did it time and time again. The Marine Corps said, Sean, this, this is incredible. These units are accomplishing the impossible. Go in there, find out how it's being done so you can share that story. And so when I did this time and time again across multiple combat tours, I began to realize there's something special about these folks, not because they're especially brilliant, not because they're Mensa level uh, in, intelligent, and not even because they're very experienced. I mean, some of these folks were 18, 19, 20 years old. Yeah. the age of some of our uh, very junior sales mm -hmm. reps. And as I began to go in there, and I'll, I'll play a video for the folks catching this on uh, on the video version, and if you're just catching this on the podcast format, it's a, a video of Marines clearing rooms. So if you've ever watched a SWAT team do its thing or you've watched a military movie, when those teams go into a room and they're all pointing their rifles different directions, they're not communicating with words, they're communicating with hand signals, or maybe not even that. They know where everybody is supposed to be and when. I saw this happen again and again, John, and I realized these folks are bulletproof. They know mm -hmm. where a potential enemy is going to be hiding. They know how not to injure each other as they go through with live weapons, uh, grenades, rockets, ammunition in, in, inside of these really tightly packed houses. And I realized hey, they're not bulletproof because they've been hit by a extraterrestrial meteor. They're not bulletproof because they've been bitten by a radioactive spider. I began to realize something that we realize all sales teams could benefit from, John. And that's that these high performing teams were bulletproof because of all of the times their predecessors hadn't been. See, they had mm. a system, a process where after each sales call, if you will, they wouldn't just hang the phone up, enter a quick note into the CRM and, and on to the next thing. No, they would take the time to assess what went right on that sales call or that mission. What went wrong? What could I do better? What could my company provide me with next time or what? education do I need to get so that I'm more prepared for another phone call like that or another meeting like that with a prospect. And when we began to realize mm -hmm. that this had a lot of crossover into the world of business, I began to enter the field of sales and say, well, what are the best teams in this world doing? And I realized that the very best salespeople, whether they knew it or not, were systemizing their processes. Yeah. Some of them were keeping mm -hmm. it in their heads. Some of it were downloading into something like a CRM, which I know you're very familiar with, but they weren't just hoping that the next call would go right. well or that the next prospect would would have the answers that they needed. Now, they were removing yeah. hope from their sales strategy one system at a time. Yeah, and I think it's, I, I think, Sean, I think it's so fascinating. I mean, you know, with the, even the video you're just showing there is, um, as you said, it's learning from predecessors and then it's training, 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 isn't it? And mm -hmm. I think that is the, if you want to say one thing that maybe differentiates the guys going room to room from most of uh, most of a lot of no, not say most of many salespeople out there <laughs> is the constant is the constant training and honing of skills. We we just yes. don't do that. Absolutely, that's right. And the the book that I wrote on this topic, Bulletproof Selling, um, I, I wanted letters so big that they couldn't be ignored, uh, but I didn't <laughs> want to put it on the cover of the book. So I'll, I'll show you, John, on the inside of Bulletproof Selling, mm -hmm. it says, "Hope is not a sales strategy." 
And that's something yep. that I get to teach all over the country to Fortune 100 companies, all the way down to home-based businesses. And when we say that hope is not a sales strategy, well, great. What do we replace hope with? And it's those systems, it's those processes, whether we are taking the best practices of our existing team, or maybe you're a sales rep that's geographically separated and you, your company just doesn't have a culture where they share best practices. Yeah. Well, how can you begin doing that on your own? And I'll tell you, John, the one thing I found that was critical, essential in capturing best practices in running a process or a systems-based sales practice is a CRM. Because these things mm -hmm. are built to house sales systems. They're built to house campaigns, templates, workflows, yep. pipelines, so that I know what is the actual health of my sales life cycle here. How many people are at the beginning of my pipeline? How many people are closer to becoming prospects or customers at the end? And you can try to manage that out of a spreadsheet. I know a lot of salespeople do. A lot of senior mm -hmm. salespeople just use a notebook. I mean, just pen and paper. Mm -hmm. And they think they can track dozens or hundreds of prospects there. But I think you and I both know, John, that without a CRM, we are basing our sales strategy on hope. Yeah, no, 100%. And I think uh, one of the interesting things there is uh, that we still have this kind of legacy hangover thing where some you know, people will push back and say, well, you know, process is great for other things, but for sales, it's really the art. It's the art of it. You know, <laughs> I love the way that, I yeah. do it, I, I do it, I do it my way and blah, blah, blah. Uh -huh. And, and yet to your point is just like, just like everything else is when you have good processes and good, good systems in place, they should be helping you and enhancing yeah. you and you got and i think that's one of the things that you've got to people got to get over this it may be true of the past or maybe true of legacy systems but find find efficient systems that help you and then build efficient processes yeah and let's talk a little bit about what you mentioned that a lot of salespeople think well this mm -hmm. is an art um, and i've yep. heard this from senior sales reps across the country john well every single co prospect conversation is different every single sale is different mm -hmm. i can't use a system because everything is unique well, let's, let's talk about what it means to make something an art. It means that you have mm -hmm. the ability to innovate on the fly. Whether you're looking at a master painter or a master salesperson, they're not going rote by rote by rote. It's not a paint by sure. numbers process. Sales was never meant to be that. And so when I talk about systems, I'm not talking about something that forces you into lockstep where yeah. you have to execute things in a specific order. And this is actually something that we discovered studying these combat troops that absolutely applies to salespeople across the spectrum. We call it an, an innovation scale. And what it really looks like is the ability that we all have to be completely present and to rely on best practices while still being able to innovate. And what that means is, and you, you've seen this drawn across dozens of salespeople, I'm sure, where you have a senior salesperson that shows up to a conversation with maybe nothing but a blank sheet of paper in front of them. Well, how do they mm -hmm. do that and still close the sale? And many of them do. Many of your listeners are probably that type of salesperson. Yeah. Well, they do it because of the 10,000 failed attempts they've had throughout the course of their yeah. career. All the objections they've heard that have shut them down. All of the uh, the meetings that didn't happen because they didn't set it up the right way. They didn't give that prospect enough reason to want to show mm -hmm. up. Then you have junior salespeople. They show up to a meeting and they've got checklist after checklist after process after training sheet. They've got their scripts printed out in front of them, all 87 pages. Mm -hmm. And they still find a way to dork that sale up. And that happens because yep. they can't innovate. They're too focused on what is the next step in this sequence that I'm supposed to execute because I'm new to the field. I don't know enough about it to be able to really trust my instinct like that senior salesperson does. Well, John, systems can solve both of those problems because what they allow a senior salesperson to do is to just have a very simple checklist in front of them so that they can be mm -hmm. fully present and innovate at a much higher level. And for that junior salesperson, once you get the basic systems down, then you know, I don't have to think about what comes next because that's really where most of our mental energy as salespeople is, is, is spent. Mm -hmm. And it's really burned in an ineffective way, thinking if I don't hang up this call and get at least these three pieces of information, my sales VP is going to chew me out because this person will be no further down the pipeline. I didn't qualify them for budget. I forgot to ask about their buying cycle. Mm -hmm. All the things that we have to learn the hard way, most of us, over the course of a sales career, you absolutely have to accomplish in a buyer meeting. Well, with a system in front of us, we can have those things set aside so that we know we need to get to them, but we can also let that conversation unfold. We can provide more value because we can be present with our prospects and actually pay attention to what their challenges are so that we can not just show up with a, a widget that has some features that we want to vomit over yeah. our prospect <clears throat> for a half hour, mm -hmm. but actually solve yeah. a problem that they're having in their life or their business.
Mm-hmm. And so, so Sean, um, when you're in combat, because I've talked to a few other people who were in combat, and obviously never having done it myself, but whatever they say, always say is, you know, you have you fall back on your training, and so, mm-hmm. as you said, the basic systems in place, and then you adapt to what's going on. And I think that's the. I think I think that's such a great um analogy for people is you know you you do the basics first and then you then you adapt to the situation as it unfolds because that's when the situation starts to be different but there's a lot of commonality between every situation too especially in sales and i'd say that it's something that drilled into us from a very early age in the military is that Mm -hmm. no plan survives contact with the enemy uh, it, it was right. a German, you know, field marshal that said that hundreds of years ago, and it still holds true today. And I, I, when I'm sharing this message from stages across the country or in sales teams, I'll say that that's absolutely true because I've seen it fold out. No matter how tightly wound your plan is, as soon as you get in contact with the enemy, that plan has to shift. It has to pivot. The other thing I'll say is that no sales plan survives contact with a prospect because yep. you're dealing with someone who has a whole different set of issues than you think you might have. You're dealing with people that are actually out there in the field every day, managing teams, trying to manage businesses, trying to move their goals forward down the field. And if we don't take the time to really pause, no matter how tightly wound our systems are, and figure out what does this prospect need right now that would make this meeting worth their time, even if it's not selling to them today, how can I tee it up Mm -hmm. so well that they're going to only remember me as their preferred vendor of choice? Well, then you can still win that sale. So it's not always about winning the entire war in a single session. We have to be willing to pivot on the battlefield of business and really make sure that we're tracking what's working and what's not. And how can I be of greatest service to my clients and my customers? And uh, John, you mentioned something absolutely critical. I would be uh, that really just felt awful if we didn't touch on, which is how do you keep these things up to date? Because any system that worked in 1977 is probably not going to work as well today Mm -hmm. in the year 2022. But yet so many salespeople are still... And I love them. I got a whole bookshelf full of them. Zig Ziglar, uh, you know, the, uh, the, 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 it's your ship. Uh, you know, I'm just looking at yep. like uh, Grant Cardone, you know, all these sales books that were really, really great when they were written, still applicable today, but you got to bring them up to date. You have to make them current. Yes. And if we're not taking the time to look at our systems, whatever they are, scripts, checklists, workflows, campaigns, and ask on a regular basis, how could I improve these? In order to bring them more up to date, to be more in line with what we're seeing out there in the field today that our clients and our prospects need, then your systems are not going to get you the results that you're after. No, no, absolutely. And I think uh, w- one of the things that was happening before the pandemic was there was there was a lot of talk about digital transformation and, and all of that. And a lot of people were kind of paying lip service to it, to be honest. And then we had the pandemic and then a lot of people realized, shoot, I better get my digital processes in place now. Honestly, I don't think you can survive going forward unless you have a good system in place, you've good digital processes. And at the end of the day here, here's the thing, Sean, is it's not something for salespeople to be afraid of. It's actually something for them to celebrate, because if you have good processes, good automation, you can take away the routine and the rote and then the salesperson, then we can come to the art piece where you really bring your personality and your and, and everything about you into play. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's absolutely right. And you know, even for me, I'm, I live the the walk that I talk. So mm-hmm. when I'm as soon as I'm, I'm off this call and right before I was on this call, I'm inside of my CRM executing sales systems. And what I love about being able to use sales systems for myself, John, is that, like you mentioned, it allows me to be more present with the people I'm reaching out to. I don't have to think about in every conversation, who is this person and where are they in my mm-hmm. pipeline? How much do I know about them and their company? What was the last conversation we had? What did we talk about then? What did I promise that I would send them? Did I deliver on it? All the things that come up with just about every prospect conversation from cold call all the way to fully developed lead about to close with a proposal. We need to know these things. And if we don't have systems to capture that, then we have to do a brain dump and hope that we remember everything that happened in the last six months, eight months, 18 months, however long we've been in contact with that prospect. But with systems, with automations, all I have to do is open up my CRM and it tells me, Sean, here are the phone calls you need to make today. I can get into that account and very quickly see with a glance everything that I've learned about that prospect in their company. So that when I show up today on the phone, I can show up with something that's relevant, that's up to date, that actually helps them solve a problem that they've told me that they have. And of course, at the end of every conversation, I'm not just relying on my prospect to get back to me when they're ready to buy. I'm owning that next step. And of course, there are great systems that you can run through a CRM to make sure that no prospect ever falls through the cracks of a campaign again. That way, 
you can serve more people, sell more stuff and make a better living and a better quality life for you and your family. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things you touched on there, this is want to come back to is this idea of being present. Because yeah, if you get everything set up, if you have your CRM, if the CRM and you understand you've done your research, you've done your call planning, all of that good stuff, uh, then you then you can be present. If you haven't, it's a lot harder mm-hmm. to be present because now you're scrambling and you're trying to multitask. And let's face it, we're, we're terrible multitaskers. I mean, people think, you know, oh, oh, multitasking, but we're really not very good at multitasking. We really are unitaskers at the end of the day. Um, mm-hmm. But as you said, if you haven't, if you haven't laid the prep work down, then you can't be 100 percent present. Mm-hmm. And so as you're out there prospecting, then a lot of salespeople say, well, this all sounds great, John, but how do I actually begin yeah. to use it? Um, same way we did in the military. I recommend you take it from the strategic to the tactical. And so we'll use a single account as an example because it's easier to see it through the lens of a single prospect. When I get into a prospect account, and I do this for myself, I do this for the organizations that I coach and their teams, I ask, where is this prospect in the pipeline? Mm -hmm. If they're at the early stages, I know nothing about them other than they're moderately qualified. Well, that's going to really delineate what steps I need to take next. I need to gather some information. I need to do some research. I need to show up, not just knowing the name of the company. Maybe let's find out who's on the executive board, look at their 10Ks if they're publicly traded, all the things that we know to do to an early account. But if they're deeper in in the pipeline, well, I know who the decision maker is. I know probably what their budget is. I know what other vendors they might have used in the past that sell something similar to me. I know what problems they're having in their business that I could start bringing solutions to that tie back to the product or service that I sell. So knowing where someone is in the pipeline, that's the strategy. Now you dive into tactics. I'm on the phone with them, knowing where they are, which means I know what information I need to make that call a success. Are we at the stage where we're really ready for a proposal because they've qualified for budget? They're in their buying window. They've said they have a need. They recognize me as a uh, a viable vendor for that. Great. Now we're at that stage. But if we're not, it doesn't make a lot of sense for me to try to press something 100 yards down the field in a single play, to use a a football term Mm -hmm. that we use here in the States. I need to take it a little slower, a couple plays at a time. And so in the tactics version, once I know what I need to achieve, I've got my goal set. I've got my mission set for this one call, for this one prospect. Now I can start using the things that CRMs are made for, call scripts. I can use if-then scenarios. I can use flow charts, Mm -hmm. depending on how deep I want to get into that conversation. I can have my discovery questions in front of me, all basic sales systems that allow us to remove hope from our brains that we hope we remember all the things to ask and allow us to be more present. And so... Once you run through all of that, now you've actually removed hope in a way that few salespeople are able to do until the very later stages of their careers. So this allows a junior salesperson to spin up a lot faster, and it allows a senior salesperson to begin capturing things. Because, John, one thing I want to make sure that I mention to your audience is systems don't stop when the sales call ends. In fact, that's really when they just begin. It's taking the time Mm -hmm. to assess that call, like I talked about in the early part of this interview, to ask, what could I have done better as a salesperson on that call? Did I hear an objection that just shut me down cold? I need to go research how to overcome or get around that next time. That I learned something about that prospect that I should have had an answer for, but I didn't. What can I go research in the product or service that I sell? And of course, for the company that I work for, if that prospect requested something that I know should be a resource my company has on hand, why wouldn't I tell my sales leader about that? We need pricing sheets. We need discount tables. We need delivery timelines. Whatever it is that prospect asked for that you just didn't have an answer to. Well, don't let the same thing shut a sale down more than once. That's the beauty of a a continuously updated system, John, just like the ones we're talking about, that I can get better every single day of the week and over the course of a year. Well, it's amazing what kind of results that can produce in a pipeline. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because it's it's a it is interesting. Sometimes you know I'll hear from people and say about you know sales process, and they'll go, oh yeah, yeah, we have a sales process, and I go, oh yeah. When, when was the last time you reviewed or updated it? And they go, oh, it's been a few years now. And you're thinking, <laughs> you know, sales processes should be dynamic. Buyers are dynamic. Yeah. The world is dynamic. Yes. My goodness, it's not, it couldn't get more dynamic than it is right now. So yep. you got to be going in and tweaking. And I think that's the thing about process, as you said, is process isn't a static thing. You don't create it once. You, you start somewhere and then you tweak and adapt and change as you go. Absolutely right. And we learned this, uh, I want to say the hard way, but we saw it in the military and it really tuned my brain into when it's time to update a process. You see, when we went into Iraq in 2003, John, we were fighting the same way that we might have in Desert Storm 10, 15 years earlier in that we were in these open topped Humvees with just canvas covering us up. So 
you could basically throw a rock through this stuff. That's how soft it was. Don't even question about bullets. Like they're going straight through it. Right. Well, that worked mm -hmm. in 2003 when we were on the move, often outpacing our own supply lines, you know, moving so fast we didn't have water or, or ammo resupply because our goal was to get to mm -hmm. Baghdad as quickly as possible. 2004, the dynamic changed. Our mission set changed. Not where we were just like rushing around the country anymore. We were all stationed in specific cities like Fallujah or Ramadi. And our goal was to mm -hmm. patrol these neighborhoods. Well, of course, the folks that didn't want us there, the insurgents, they realized real quick these open top Humvees could be taken apart pretty easily with a bomb. So we had to pivot. We had to update our process, our gear, our strategy and our tactics, had to start putting armor up on our Humvees. And these are the, the early days. And if you know anything about Marines, right. John, you know that we kind of make things happen with whatever we happen to have around. So we yeah. were stealing yeah. pieces of sheet metal and just mm -hmm. bolting it to the side of our Humvees. That's how low tech we were. But it got the job done. But of course, the dynamic changed again. The enemy realized or they're using sheet metal now. We'll start making bigger bombs. So eventually mm -hmm. we had to move away from Humvees entirely and use these up-armored vehicles that look like small tanks. Those yeah. were the safest thing that we could come up with. But I tell that story to let salespeople know that what might have worked a couple of years ago isn't going to have the same impact or effect today in moving that sale forward. And if we really look at how are we seeing the market change around us? How are we seeing the lives of our prospects and what they care about change? Why not take the time to build what isn't needed today, but what is going to be needed tomorrow. And that might look like a product or service, or it might look like a call script that really drills into mm -hmm. Mr. and Ms. Prospect. You might not have been aware of this, but we're seeing this trend across your industry that's leading to tomorrow looking a lot different. And we've built some things. We've compiled some white papers, produced some reports, interviewed a bunch of CEOs that are forward thinking. We can tell you a little bit about what's going to happen tomorrow. And wouldn't that be valuable enough to hop on a 15 minute call for and again, it's yeah. that same mentality. How can we prepare for the future so that that mission that we're tasked with tomorrow, we have a better chance of success in? It's a lot harder to pivot on the fly than it is to just take the time, even if it's five minutes a week, and ask, yeah. what does next week look like for my prospects in their industry? What's changing? And how can I be prepared to meet them where I know they're going to be in the future rather than where they are today? Yeah, no, I, 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 absolutely. And I think, uh, I mean, you can take it uh, a good example from from the pandemic right is when suddenly a lot of people were selling virtually this was brand new to and to sometimes this is brand new to sales people who've been around for years and years and and it was funny because you get some people who you could walk into a room full of people and they're on fire they're like hey mm -hmm. you know look, work the room put them on a zoom call and they're like hostage video it's like yeah they don't know what to do oh, <laughs> they don't know what to do but it's interesting to your point is it's like with the Humvees, there is an evolution now that everybody has to take into account. Will you go back to face-to-face -to -face selling? Yeah, sure, in many industries. Yeah. But will there be a lot of virtual selling too? Sure, absolutely. And the one thing, some of your prospects might actually not want you to come and visit them. That's the mm -hmm. thing that people don't understand because this, have you seen this where people say, oh, you know, you're not that far away or come visit you. And then they say, well, no, let's just do it virtually. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people will do that. They just don't want to leave the house. Uh, a lot of us mm -hmm. are, are, you know, we had to let go of our office space. The companies we're working for just let go of that lease. So now we're permanently home based. So we can either run our sales meetings from our home office, like you see me in today, or mm -hmm. we can be out there on the road. And I'd say for people out there in the world of sales where you're, you're doing that kind of hybrid model, I would ask myself, what resources work in both of those environments? So checklists are great. Um, I can run an entire virtual meeting where it appears like I'm looking directly at the camera, but I'm actually looking yep. at a very built out kind of a, a field guide for moving a sale mm -hmm. forward in my industry, who the buyer is, what their challenges are, um, you know, when their buying window is going to come up. So I've got my checklist in front of me. I never leave a call having forgotten something to ask. And I can do that and be present because I've got it in front of me. A little tougher to do that when you're in an in-person meeting, of course, because you don't want to be you know, looking away from your buyer yeah. the entire time and never making eye contact. But how can you adapt something that works really well in the virtual world to something that's going to work well in an in-person meeting? Maybe it's just a checklist in front of you that's pretty basic so that as you're writing notes, you can just review it on the facing page. That's been a sales tactic for years that helps people keep a system in order. And for video, of course, I mean... We had to learn the hard way, John, and I'm sure you still see it where people are just not paying attention to their video. They'll, uh, If you can mm -hmm. see this you know, on, on your screen, if you're watching, I've been in a lot of sales yeah. meetings that look like this, where it's just like the <laughs> upper half of my head, or they're, they're absolutely looking down at the keyboard. It's like, oh, come on, guys. You, you have to just at least get yourselves in frame. Well, why not yeah, yeah. transfer that over to your in-person sales meetings as well? Why not situate yourself so that the buyer is not looking at the sun directly behind you? 
It doesn't work in video and it doesn't work in real life either. So it's a situational awareness that we can take out of either environment to say, I have to learn how to do this. But if it doesn't have applicability in the rest of my life, it's kind of a, a one hit wonder. And I don't have any time yeah. for that. The Marines that I trained with didn't have any time for that. So it's always looking at what works here and how can I use that to boost results in every other area of my sales life. And again, this isn't something that you have to take a month off every year to figure out. It's a five minute process you can go through at the end mm -hmm. of each day to say, what did I learn today? What would I like to try again tomorrow? Or what would I like to try anew? And how do I go get that information so that I can test it so that I can see? Does a new system get me better results in this area? Yeah. And and I love that, Sean. You're the first person who's actually flipped things around and said, you know, what can we take from the virtual world into the face to face world? Because mostly it's people uh, talking about how can we recreate things virtually? So I, I think that's a that's a fantastic example there of even not many people. And I don't actually think of it there. Um, it's a great, great idea is to look at what are the benefits of what you're doing and how can you translate those or adapt those benefits uh, for face to face selling? Uh, mm -hmm. So listen, Sean, this, is, this has been fantastic. And all of Sean's information will be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Sure. So I run a company called Bulletproof Selling. Um, our goal is to take sales teams and make them into sales forces. And that really involves being experts at how do you build out a sales-driven and a systems-driven pipeline. Instead of hoping that you know where your prospects are, you know exactly where they are and what the next thing that needs to happen is to get closer to your mission objective. So we talked a lot about sales systems, John. That's a pretty overwhelming topic because there's no part of a sales cycle it doesn't apply to from big picture yep. pipelines all the way down to how do I overcome that objection? So what we did on our website was stood up a five minute sales assessment that will build you a sales system based on what you tell me your biggest need in the field of sales is. So if you go to bulletproof-selling.com, you'll see that five minute sales assessment there absolutely free and it'll immediately generate a system that you can use. Try out, try what it's like to actually use a system and how you sell and see if you don't get better results and see if you can't be more present with your prospects as a result. Um, so we also have a podcast called Bulletproof Selling, a live stream that we do exactly like this. We'll absolutely have to have you as a guest on, John. And uh, yeah, we're just out here to remove hope from the sales strategy of salespeople around the world. Yeah, I love it, Sean. Listen, thanks very much. Thanks very much for today. Fascinating insights. As I said, all the information of Sean will be below this video. Please go check it out. Go check out the book. Go take uh, take the sales uh, the the process and the system uh, uh, wizard that they have on the site. And uh, yeah, it's it's fantastic. I really, really would encourage you to check it out because you know systems. We all need systems. Stop stop running away from systems. <laughs> they're, they're done right. They're there to help us. All right, well, listen, thanks again, Sean, and thank you all for watching and listening, and I'll see you all again really soon.